The search engine Google was born in that hotbed of technological innovation, the computer science department at Stanford University. Larry Page and Sergey Brin met as grad students in 1995. They had much in common. Their fathers were both college profs and their mothers were scientists. Both were born in 1973. Both grew up with and loved anything to do with computers. Sergey Brin, born in Russia, was the math prodigy who loved swimming and gymnastics. Larry Page was the inventor looking to change the world. They created their earliest search engine from off-the-shelf computer components, some of which they begged and borrowed from the university. And after they maxed out their personal credit cards, they came up with some ingenious solutions to their limited finances. And then Larry discovered that he could get a better deal by buying the individual disks without the cases. Uh, and they, were, they built their own machine and they got more storage for the same amount of money. With a structure made of toy building blocks and their secret algorithm sauce, which they called Backrub, they cobbled together a revolutionary new search engine. One could immediately see that the ordering of the pages was substantially better than what AltaVista was, was, was providing. I think what they realized is that working on it in the context of a university research project didn't give them the scope and the scale that they really needed to make it work. So they said, well, let's take a leave. Let's go off, do a company, get it working, and then we can come back and finish up the research. Larry and Sergey were preparing to leave Stanford to start up their search engine company, which by this time they registered as Google, a misspelling of a mathematical term for one with a hundred zeros after it. Unlike other search sites, the Google homepage was clean and efficient, free of annoying banner ads and pop-ups. Larry Page and Sergey Brin watched as their search engine Google became more and more popular, but that engine still wasn't translating into real money and they had no viable business plan to make Google turn a profit. Our founders decided that for the longest time that we weren't going to get into the ad business. However, I think the breakthrough idea came when we said, look, why don't we just show ads that are purely text-based and doesn't have any you know, moving images or distracting stuff. Based on the search, Google would provide simple ads for people to click through. So on October 2000, Google embarked on a new business, online advertising. Almost immediately, ad money started to flood in, and pressure grew on Larry and Sergey from their venture capitalist investors. They wanted an experienced CEO to run the place. Larry and Sergey chose a seasoned veteran of the tech world, Eric Schmidt. He had successfully run software maker Novell, and before that, he was with Sun Microsystems. But perhaps what was more important for the founders was that he shared with them a background as a computer science engineer, married to a strong entrepreneurial drive. Well, Google has taken the position that creativity occurs from individual entrepreneurs deep inside the company, often who have an idea but don't have time to work on it. So we invented a concept called 20% time. And every technical person in the company is supposed to, and we encourage them to spend 20% of their professional time on things that they find interesting, not things that we find interesting. Employee number 23, Paul Buckheit, who was the originator of the motto, don't be evil, was also the engineer who in just one day came up with Gmail, an email program used internally by Googlers. What I recall from the meetings, which occurred over about a year, was this constant debate of what kind of features would advertising work and so forth. And we ultimately decided to try it. And we, in fact, la launched Gmail on April 1st. It was seen largely as a joke. The addition of targeted ads to Gmail in 2004 proved to be no joke, adding to Google's ever burgeoning bottom line. Google had transformed itself into an advertising money-making machine. The Googleplex, as it is known by the Googlers who inhabit it, are made to feel that they are the best and brightest. It's an office that doesn't look like one. Free snacks. Free meals. In the gym, free weights. Plus, places to play music. And every other amenity they could think of. What do you need a tent for? 
you know what? This is actually a great space for the odd meeting or to just come back, kick back. The trend in most workplaces is less space, privacy, cost. Google won't say what all this costs, only that it's worth it. We look at it as a long-term investment in our people. Uh, we want to be able to train them and hang on to them. Google is kind of a unique company for me and for I think for a lot of people that work there. What Google does is it allows you a fantastic environment to be innovative and to get your product developed really quickly. It is a very different structure than the rest of the engineering community. We always really try to avoid bureaucracy so that people can really do what makes sense in their project. One thing that's great about Google is that you have a lot of autonomy over your product and its directions. We're encouraged to work on whatever we think is important. Often the best ideas come from employees. At Google, if you come in in your first week and you have a good idea on how things should be done and people agree with you, in that first week you can start making those changes. I think Google goes after people that are entrepreneurial, that are uh, kind of go-getters. Everyone in the company is just so accessible and everyone's really driven to make the company succeed. We have people straight out of college, we have people who've been in the industry for 25 years. The concentration of talent that we have at Google is really quite amazing. I come to work and I look forward to the conversations I'm going to have during the day with my colleagues and with people I haven't met yet within the company because I know that today I'm going to find five new great ideas that I'm going to get excited about. I feel one of the greatest things about Larry and Sergey, they surrounded themselves with the best and most brilliant people that they could find. Google receives more than a million job applications a year. However, to join the ranks of some 20,000 worldwide Googlers requires passage through a grueling series of tests and interviews. I probably went through somewhere between 10 to 15 interviews at the time. And then finally, my last interview was with Larry. And so, you know, literally I just came in one day and actually got to sit down in Larry Page's office and, uh, and interview with him. And he asked me a bunch of tough questions and uh, I didn't, didn't quite know how I did, but, uh, but apparently he liked me enough to, to the point where they decided to give me an offer. We believe in having whiteboards all over the place. And the reason for that is to really spur creativity uh, so that, you know, you can, you can draw things and communicate ideas and, and work with other people on that idea. I think what makes Google different to every other organization in the world, it's its internal cultures. It's the freedom that we give to our employees to pursue their own ideas. And it's the fact that we treat everyone the same. We have people from engineering background, business background, medicine background, every single person you get the chance to learn from. It's a place where you get to interact with very, very intelligent people and it kind of keeps you on your toes, but at the same time, it's a very fun place to work. Google Garage is our hacker maker design space for Googlers. So it is this, this commons where Googlers can come together across the company to learn and create and make. When we first started, we didn't know we were going to create this. So a group of us got together outside of our core roles, and we were thinking about how can we scale this culture of experimentation that's so core to Google. And we really wanted to help Googlers make time to work on their crazy ideas. And what we learned was that building a space can facilitate that. Really, the environment influences human behavior. So if you want to encourage creativity and wild ideas and moonshot thinking, you should create that exact environment which helps you to achieve that. Google's a really big company now. In this space, you have people from marketing and corporate engineering, people ops. So you see people from all of our different products and all of our different organizations coming here together. One thing that was an accident is we packed in way too many people into this space. So they were like literally elbow to elbow. And what happened is they kind of just had to collaborate. If you can't ignore the person next to you, you may as well work with them. I think that's really important to get people with different backgrounds, with different interests, with different roles together, working on a specific challenge and figure out a solution because that can really challenge your own assumptions um, of the problem, but help you to find really interesting solutions and creative ways of solving something. So when people think of Google and its people practices, they think of free food, dogs roaming the hallways, rock climbing walls. What are all these perks for? And, and if they went away tomorrow, would it make any difference? So two thoughts. First, the reason we do all these things, not just the cafes and the dogs and kind of the fun things like massage programs, 
but also how we think about all our benefits and perquisites is to achieve three purposes. Number one is to create a community. So if you walk around campus, you see micro kitchens periodically across all the floors. And it's not because we think people will starve if they go a few hours without eating. It's because we think it's important to have informal places for people to interact and, and come together. The second is to drive innovation, actually. Because if you listen to the conversations people are having in those places, it's as often as not about products, about users, about how do you come up with new things. And we don't believe you can sort of force or manufacture innovation, but we do believe you can sort of create a higher likelihood of serendipity by causing people to interact more and creating an environment where people are more free to come up with ideas. The last is efficiency. So we have things like on-site oil changes, uh, on-site car wash, dry cleaning service, and that's because we want people at work to work very efficiently and be focused. But because they work so hard in their personal lives, we want them not to have to worry about it. And so we want their lives to kind of run efficiently. More broadly, though, to the second part of your question, I actually believe if you took all of that stuff away, all of the flashy bells and whistles, you would still have the same company, the same drive for creativity and innovation. And the reason is, those are kind of nice enabling factors, but what really makes, I think, the company tick is this tremendous focus on data, this tremendous willingness to experiment, this tremendous focus on users, and this unbelievable assemblage of talent which, when you put it together, creates an environment where people are constantly challenging themselves to come up with new, interesting things. For the past three years, Google has been in the top four of Fortune's best 100 companies to work for. What are the keys to motivating and engaging your employees? What Googlers tell us keeps them engaged and motivated here more than anything else is the mission of the company. If you talk to anybody at Google and ask them what's the mission, they'll say to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible. And it's rare to find a place where everyone actually knows the mission and then they actually believe it. So there's a bit of selection, but that mission is something that I think to many people here is actually kind of a noble goal and it's inspirational, number one. Number two, there's this kind of bundled notion of both freedom and transparency and access to information. You get lots of information about what's going on, you have resources, you can try things, you can experiment, you can fail, learn from it, go on and do great things. And it's not always a comfortable environment, but it's a secure one where it's okay to fail as long as you learn from it. So, so for your leaders and your middle managers, that must require you know, certain skills and behaviors to be able to live in this kind of uh, democratic environment. Uh, what we find is when you join Google, many people, particularly at senior levels, have to actually unlearn behaviors. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, credibility at Google and influence does not come from title, it doesn't come from authority. It comes from your ability to articulate a position and then sort of argue it successfully. Um, politics is crushed in the company. The worst thing you can do is be self-promoting and political. And in many organizations, there's some virtue to be able to, to know, oh, I should drop the CEO a note on this or my manager on this. Um, here, it, it just signals that you don't get how the place works. An insatiable appetite for the new and innovative spanning a wide spectrum of technologies means Google is constantly on the prowl. Everyone assumes that we're busy competing in the last war when in fact we're going to invent something new. That's how Google works. Whatever product idea I have is from the old times. And they say, oh, Eric, what a stupid idea. Why don't you try this new idea, which I haven't thought about. That's the genius of Google. We also have teams looking for great technology in small companies that we can pick up, that we can buy, where they would benefit from the structure of Google. That's how YouTube became a Google product, as did Google Earth and Picasso. I think Google attracts people who care, who care about users, who care about their fellow human, who care about the planet, and just can't sit still. They built a company that absolutely changed the world.